Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 15 of Dream Big and Live Free. I'm your host, Savvy Barrows, and thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. Please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts, and follow me at Savvy Barrows on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and message me and let me know what you think about the show. This week, I've brought Joe Salicito to share some insights on why your struggles are your biggest strengths. Joe is the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Claremont Lincoln University, and the school's goal is to equip students with the 21st century skills they need to succeed in today's workforce. The Claremont Core, which is their set of four innovative skills, in mindfulness, dialogue, collaboration, and change, prepare students for the next level of engagement and leadership. Joe is also the co-host of the EdUp Experience podcast, where the goal is to inspire people to pursue a lifelong learning mindset, no matter the path they choose. Joe lives with his wife, Antonella, and kids, Gemma and Julio. And when he's not spending time with them or working, Joe loves to work out, podcast, and he also secretly loves video gaming. Joe, welcome to the show. So happy to have you. Thank you. I'm honored, uh, honored to be here. And a one slight correction, my last name is, is pronounced Salustio. So when you say it, you've got to have a little Italian panache behind it. So, but I uh, appreciate you and me on. <laughs> Joe, I did my best, and that's what counts, you all did right? Great. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So good to have you on the show. And so um, you and your team are working on some pretty leading edge stuff at Claremont, where you're enlightening people while educating them on how to become better leaders in the world. You're the EVP and COO, but you had quite the life journey to getting to where you are today. In fact, it's actually a little ironic, if you don't mind me saying so, about the role that you play in education today based on your story. So maybe that's a good way for us to, to kick it off. Maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about your childhood and, you know, where did you grow up? Um, sure, I would love to. Um, I, I could tell you all about Syracuse, New York, which is where I was born and raised. And <clears throat> excuse me, Syracuse is for anyone listening that doesn't know about upstate New York, it snows all the time. Um, in fact, Syracuse, New York, and Buffalo, New York go back and forth as the snowiest city in the country. So you're talking about about eight months of snow. You learn how to shovel a driveway like a pro. Um, and they hadn't really made snowblowers um, as effective as they are now when I was a kid. So it was really hard, hard living, shoveling snow for like eight months out of the year. Um, and so I'm from Syracuse. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I grew up, went to school there and uh, have since made my way west. Uh, with every move I make, I get further west. I don't think I, if I go any further west, I'm in the Pacific Ocean at this point. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks so much for sharing with our audience a little bit of, of the background of, of where you grew up. Um, yeah, we have people all over the world listening listening to the show. Um, but let's start to get into a little bit of your journey, you know, heading to your career today. So you shared with me um, that you and you started out in high school, like you sort of had it, you started having some trouble in, in your junior year. So can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I... I was, a, I was a successful academic uh, kid for a while. Um, you know, I think um, I, I really started to perform poorly when I met math. It was really when I started to lose a taste for, for academics. Let's call it uh, my freshman and sophomore years. I was sort of hanging on um, of high school. And then I made a, a switch to a new high school in my junior year. And, you know, I, I went to a fairly big high school. It had about uh, 1,000 kids uh, or so, which was a pretty sizable high school. And then I switched to one that had a lot less. So it was really tight uh, groups. I, I played soccer, so that, so that was helpful. But at the same time, when you start a new school, you want to be accepted. And so acceptance became much greater than academic performance. It became my number one priority. So I let um, academic uh, 
a proficiency slip and, and in fact came to hate school with a passion. Um, I, I, the only reason I think I stayed in school through high school because I thought about quitting a million times was because I played sports and because my, my parents would have kicked my behind if I, if I had dropped out. It wasn't what you did in my family. That's not what you did. But I really had no desire to go to school. I wanted to work, to be honest. I just wanted to work. But, but school uh, and I did not mix for a long time, which that's where the irony is, you know? Yeah, and um, I think your story would really resonate with a lot of people. I mean, I, I think that today the, the traditional path is to definitely go to college, but there are a lot of people who um, they have other interests. And, and I don't really, I don't think that one way or the other is better, but you know, one, one is definitely more the traditional path. But if we could just dig into a little bit more about what you're saying around acceptance. So not only did you, um, opt for being accepted rather than academically performing, but you also had some struggles with, with bullying at school. And at that time, they, it wasn't really called bullying, but this was an additional layer of your struggle with academics. Well, you know, I think uh, um, when you're changing high schools in a critical year, like a junior year, um, you're still in the midst of what you want to uh, as a social life uh, and to have friends. And, and when you leave, uh, you know, I left a high school where I had uh, friends that were my friends since I was five years old and you move to that high school. And even though you're a town away and you can drive there in 20 minutes, that distance becomes real. And so you don't talk to your old friends as much and you have to start making new friends. And, and uh, you know, when you're new at that level, you're going to have people that don't want you there. And I experienced some of that in the junior year, not in, this, in the senior year particularly, because I figured out how to navigate it a little bit, but certainly in the junior year, where you just had people, um, a, a couple people in particular, that just felt like they needed to assert some level of dominance over, over you as, as a new kid. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, it probably would be considered bullying in this day and age back then. It was just sort of normal, you know, you're a new kid and you're going to take take a bunch of crap from the people that are there and, and they're going to haze you and you're going to have to try to figure it out. So, you know, that, that was, um, it also kept me away from focus. It focused me more on figuring out ways to navigate through that mm -hmm. nervous about passing this person in the hallway instead of worrying about studying for, for my algebra exam or whatever the heck I was doing, probably failing math. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that made it hard and, and it made me less, even less interested in school uh, because I didn't want to go, you know, and I think when you lose, when you don't want to go to school, you need people to, to kick you in the butt, which is, you know, and, and keep you going, which is what my parents did, but you have to want to go to some level and I just was losing the taste for it. Yeah, and, and you shared that it, you, you lost the taste so much for it that you even got a scholarship to, at, a, at a pretty pretty good school and you decided against it. So can you tell a little bit about why you decided against it? Because I mean, it's just a sports scholarship of any kind. I mean, that's so rare, um, but you said no to it. Which, you know, now looking back on it now, there's so much talk about debt and individuals taking on debt to go to college. And here I go with a, with a scholarship and, a, and I turn it down. But I think that what it came down to is through that, the remainder of my high school experience, I finally connected with some people who um, were going and attending a state school that happened to be closer to my house. The soccer scholarship uh, that I was given, it was a half, half ride, basically a full half ride. Which, so, the, so you think about the financial impact, the positive financial impact that would have had um, and of course, everybody in my family was pushing me to do it, probably for more reasons than, than uh, just me playing soccer, probably be, because of the debt load and, and all those things. But I turned it down because I wanted to be with people that I knew uh, going to college. So as much as I wanted to be away, when it came down to me being away from home, I actually got scared, I think. I got scared of leaving my comfortability of, uh, and support system and going away from Syracuse to Rhode Island or going away from Syracuse to uh, Cortland, which is where I went for my first year undergrad, was two hours away and I could drive back and forth to home. And so I turned down a, a half ride soccer scholarship. Um, and the biggest reason, aside from moving away uh, from home, was because I didn't think I could maintain a 3.0 GPA, which is a B. 
because I had so little confidence in my academic ability and desire to achieve that I didn't want to disappoint anyone. So instead of going to the school where I could have really done well, I went to a party school and I made that mistake. Yeah. And, and so this is when you went to Cortland, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And Cortland was a great school, by the way, don't get me wrong. I mean, this, this state university system in New York is a great school system, but it was, I chose it because I had friends that went, decided to go there, not because of any other reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you said that not only did you lack the self-confidence, that you couldn't think that you could keep up with the academics, and, and you rejected the scholarship, but when you went to Portland, you also um, immediately joined, joined a fraternity and started going through the hazing process all over again. Yeah, Savvy, I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I did. And I, you know, because now I'm, I go to college, I'm in my undergraduate, I'm still struggling with self-confidence. I'm still, you know, late bloomer, all the kids were just, you know, built into their bodies and I was a skinny kid. Um, and you know, I'm still trying to be, be in acceptance. And so, you know, fraternities are just happy to accept you at that point in your, your, you know, prepubescent college age where they're just see you like a, you know they're like jaguars attacking a piece of meat because they're going to get you in and into the fraternity and and mm -hmm. hold you tight uh and so i did i pledged a fraternity it, it was a massive mistake um this is during the times and it probably still happened but the hazing was real it was real hazing some of the stuff i had to do uh probably not appropriate for your podcast i would tell you but, but uh, certainly leaves you mental scars and you go, you know, you're already struggling with self-confidence and now you're, you're doing this really strange things and you're up late at night and you're having to listen um, to, to these people yell at you in the face and, and break you down even further to try to build you back up. And so I remember, oh boy, I was probably six, six weeks into this hazing and I go to a midterm. And by the way, you only could wear black sweatshirts. You had to wear the same black sweatshirt every day. And that's how you knew you were ple had pledged this fraternity. So I was wearing the same sweatshirt without washing it every day. So I, I probably didn't smell very good. <laughs> but I, uh, I fell asleep in a midterm exam in microeconomics. I still remember it because I had been up for like 15 hours being hazed and, you know, probably drinking and all that underage. And, uh, and fell asleep in a midterm and I, and I, and I, um, I failed. Uh, and I remember going home into my uh, dorm room and calling my mother and saying, I don't know uh, what I'm gonna do here. This is what I've done. And, my, and I got a big earful from my family uh, and threats to not pay for me to go to school anymore. You know what, if you can do something as stupid as this, then you can go get yourself a job and we're not gonna pay for you to go to school. A little bit of reverse psychology, it kept me in, uh, but um, that was a threat. And that was a real, and, and that was a real wake up call for you because that was sort of your aha moment where, where things started to change and you started to get your, your renewed focus. So you finished college and then you went back to Syracuse. And then once you were there from what you shared, you were like, oh my goodness, there's gotta be more. Well, yeah, I, I'm not, when you say I finished college, let's just say I limped through college. <laughs> Um, and, uh, that, that this is part of the irony and I'll just take a step back and say, I remember when I had transferred to the university I graduated from, which was another state of New York system called, um, a school called Oneonta in my sophomore year, towards the end of my sophomore year, I have to pick a major. And, uh, my, my, I remember my mom saying to me, you can pick anything you want. What, what are you interested in? And, and I, to this day, she reminds me, I said, absolutely nothing. I'm interested in nothing. So um, I ended up choosing uh, speech communications, which I, I always say, and I told you it was a BS and BSing because it was, I thought it would be easy. Um, it did, has helped me uh, in my career, but, but certainly what, at that time was I want to pick the easiest path I can take and graduate and get out of here as fast as possible. So I limped through and, you know, um, graduated out with like a 2.6 GPA. I, I, I got C's and D's in every class that mattered. And I got A's in ballroom dancing and racquetball. And um, uh, if you saw my transcript, you wouldn't believe it. So, so that's how it balanced out to a two seven. But I was not a success. And I had achieved, and my family had achieved, and it was really an opposite. My sisters coming behind me three years. I have twin sisters. They both achieved at higher levels, and so I was a dis I was sort of a disappointment. The 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 no dir the directionless kid. 
couldn't figure out what he wanted to do. So I limped through college. Um, but yeah, I ended up back at my parents' house. That was for me, it was like, oh my gosh, I've gone through four years of college. You know, I've, I've gotten this degree that I really wasn't even sure I wanted. And now I'm back in my same room at my mom and dad's house in Syracuse. And what am I supposed to do with my life? And that's where things started to change. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, thanks for sharing, you know, going a little bit deeper on, on, on the fact that you limped through college. Again, I, I think that there are just so many people that have this experience because, um, you know, college is kind of what you're supposed to do, whether it's whether or not your heart is in it. But we know that this is the, the baseline or supposed baseline for, for having a good career. So I really appreciate you being willing to share your struggles and even some of the, the, the choices. I don't, I don't want to say they're bad choices because I don't, I don't know if I necessarily believe in something that's called bad or good choices. I think they're paths. You choose one path versus another. And you, while you are always free to choose a path, you are never free from the consequences of your path. So you chose a path. And that led you down a certain road and you realize, eh, probably not for me. And, and, and now you're on a completely different one and we're getting there to where you are today. But let's get back to, to where you are in Syracuse at your parents' home and you're going like, what is going on? So I think you said you decided that, or, or you had a choice to make, whether you were gonna go stay with one family member on the East Coast or, or out West. So, so take us a little bit through that journey. Yeah, you know, I think that that when you when I limped, literally limped through and, and got through college, I, I still had some expectation that my life would end up being different at the end of that. And I think a lot of college kids do that all of a sudden you're going to just, you know, your life's going to be different because you, you got through college. But you know what, you got to go to work, you, you have to start, you know, now that the, the realness hits you and it's like, okay, what are you going to do with your life? You got you had, you know, I had friends, I had friends that stayed in an extra year. Six, extend wow. that time yeah. it's two years extend that time in college i was four years in and out my parents were going to pay a dime for me to go longer than four years so uh, i had a um my my grandmother owned a condo in tampa uh, in clearwater beach florida which i think is where i ended up i wanted to go but i had an aunt uh, my aunt wendy who was in denver and my grandparents um, uh, were out there in denver and said come live with us and you can stay rent free and so at that time i had no money so it was really only one choice, although I should have chose. There, it's like these points in life uh, where, like you said, there's a different path, but you always one or two or three points in your life that you look at and go, what if I had chosen this path? What would my life have been like? That, that was another ch uh, interesting choice. When I went to Denver uh, on an Amtrak, I don't know how many people that have listened have actually taken an Amtrak for like multiple days. It was a three day long Amtrak ride, lots of stops. Um, you know, basically sitting in an airplane seat for three days and uh, with three bags of clothes. And I made my way out to Denver and stayed with family for a while. Yeah. And, and for, the, for, for everyone that's listening that doesn't know what Amtrak is. So Amtrak is a train. Um, it's so he, he took a train for three days going all of the local stops, sitting in an airplane seat with three bags of clothes. So uh, I don't know. Did you shower, Joe? Like, Oh no! There's no, there's no showering on the end. You know, you, you know, there was no showering. So I showered when I got to Denver. That's when I showered. <laughs> well, I'm, that's I'm I'm glad you did. I was like, oh my god, three Me days too. showers. <laughs> so you get to Denver, you start looking for for jobs, and uh, your first job was cold calling for blood donors. Yeah. Um, still to this day, the single hardest job I've ever had. It, it, and what great work, right? But so hard. And it wasn't, uh, you know, for, for anybody that knows, you know, it's very important to give blood. You literally save lives by giving blood. So I worked for a, a blood bank called Bonfi's Blood Center and they, um, that's what they did. And I worked at a center. So my job was to call a professional who happened to be, go, you know, on their way home from work and schedule a time for them to drive to the center to give blood. You know, so who do you know that on their way home wants to stop to give blood? Not many people. They want to go home, see their family, want to go to dinner, they work late. So it was tough to get people to want to come and give an hour. It wasn't like 10 minutes. It was an hour after work at the end of the day, come give blood. It was really a humbling job 
right? Because it was a lot of calling people and then a lot of no's. So you really learn fast what you're made of uh, in a situation where you get a lot of no's. So yeah, that was an interesting job. It's still very, very hard. Yeah, I, I have to say, I have, a, I have a lot of respect for you taking that job. I actually have a lot of respect for anybody who had to spend time doing cold calls. And it's not just because I had to do it myself. Like you were calling for blood donors, you know, back in my day when I started out as a, as a cold caller, I was learning how to pitch stock over the phone. Um, nice. I, uh, yeah, so, so I think for me, the fear of like, not wanting to be embarrassed in front of my boss and my peers made me get good like really quickly. Yes. Um, but I also think that there's something about having to go through the constant rejection and getting to a point where you realize that the rejection is not a rejection of you personally. It's just you found a way where people are telling you no, and so you need to find a way for people to tell you yes. And there's exactly. something about this act of being able to depersonalize, and instead of you know going home and crying in the corner, you kind of muscle up and go, okay, well, how do I actually get better at this? It's really a tremendous growing experience. And I, I was having a conversation, I don't know if it was you in our prep call, if it was um, someone else. I said, there are two things in this world that I wish every person could experience. Number one is having to make cold calls. I strongly believe that everyone should be able to ha, ha, should be forced <laughs> to make cold calls yeah. work. And the second thing is everyone should be able to figure out how to get a yellow cab in New York City at 4 p.m. on a Friday. Like you that if that is not like, you know, the, the jungle, like I don't know what else is, but it doesn't exist anymore because, you know, we have ride hailing services. So <laughs> Well, and, it, and you know, you make such a good point because it's like overcoming the fear that you have to achieve something that feels so good when you get it, right? When you're cold calling and someone's saying no and you turn that conversation around to a yes, yeah. there's this feeling of achievement you get. Same thing with a hailing a cab. Hailing a cab for most people seems really hard when you have to jump out halfway into the street and whistle or wait, literally get in front of a moving car yeah. to stop it, you know? And half the time it has somebody in it. So you just go, sorry, you know? So, but you're right. It, it brings another level of confidence. Yeah. Another level of confidence. But what I think it's like, you get the confidence, whether you're looking for it or not, it, it, it's just yeah. this kind of slow build. But it, I, anyway, I, I think we could probably have our own podcast episode just about you, how you, how, how cold calling really gets to, to build your confidence muscle. Um, but from the blood, the blood bank, you went on and um, now you, you moved into to a wireless company that you worked at for a while. Yeah. So um, th this is where age, where you age yourself when you start talking about your background. I was selling what were called two-way pagers, uh, where you had guaranteed messaging from the person that you were paging that could page you back. It was, it was before cell phones could text. So... Um, I sold, you know, I was, I was selling against cell phone companies who were selling phone services. I was selling paging services. Uh, and you remember some of those companies like Skytel and Motorola made two way pagers. And I worked for a company called Arch Wireless. There's no longer a business for obvious reasons. Um, and it was this big shell top, literally looked like a mini computer and people would holster it, right? It was like the belt holster deal where you looked like you were, you know, carrying a, a, a literally a fanny pack, but it was a, it was a device. And so you had your phone on one hit and I did this because I had to, because I was selling it. I had my phone on one hit and I had my little two-way pager on the other hit, but it was like, you know, uh, the wild west, depending on what device we're going to use. Yeah, well, that was a hard sale too. Cell phones. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, but you know, and then I think one of the companies that sold phones figured out how to make them text with one G at that time, probably. And that was the end of Arch Wireless. I left before they, before they closed, but you could see the writing on the wall um, and uh, was lucky enough to, to, to uh, land myself in education. Yeah, so this is, the, this is the irony. So you went from someone who you know, was basically allergic to, to education, right? You wanted out of college, you didn't like it, um, you're kind of kicking and screaming. And now here you are, and at that time you were working for Heritage 
and um, you ended up like becoming a VP there. But you know, when you first started, like, can you go back and and think about like, you know, when you took that job and when you applied for that job, and and was the irony very high to yourself, like when you applied for that job? Oh, unbelievably! I I, I remember, I, you know, I needed a job. I was looking for a job, and I it was when. <laughs> I, again, when they had an ad in the paper and you would respond to classifieds, that was back before they had uh, Indeed or whatever else they have now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it said sales representative in education. And I thought, well, I'm a seller. I can sell, I can sell ice to an Eskimo. Can I sell education? Well, there's something that I wouldn't mind selling. I've been trying to sell devices to people that have absolutely no need of this device. You know, can go into a sale and, and know that the person does not need your product and you sell it to them for thousands of dollars. You know, sometimes these are bulk sales and leave going, oh man, what have I done? And, and so I was looking for some meaning too, something more meaningful, I think for a number of reasons, for direction and for purpose and um, fell into to a company called Heritage College and I responded to this ad in the paper for a sales representative in, in uh, education. Turned out that it was the, at the time uh, for-profit education sector, which you know is called career education these days, which services a lot of underprivileged uh, students, primarily from uh, tougher socioeconomic backgrounds. And uh, I, yeah, I remember walking in, I was in a uh, maroon, like a deep maroon shirt with a tie that I, I would never wear now. <laughs> and I had come from New York. I was only a year and a half out of New York and Syracuse and going to school outside in Oneonta and visiting the city all the time. And so you come to Colorado and at that time, you know, it was, Colorado was a different land. You know, people, it was a slower pace and they were very hesitant of loud, loud mouth New Yorkers. And so I came in thinking I was the best, you know, how could it, I was the best, you know, <laughs> now my confidence is growing. They hired me, you know, looking back on it, I got hired and my boss at the time told me later that it came down to me and another candidate and they just couldn't decide which one. So they took a chance on me. They thought I would fail. They had all bet on me failing. So they figured they'd hire two and one would last. Well, I happened to last. I'm a little stubborn. So I made it and the other person didn't make it. But here I am now selling education um, to students that are looking for something to improve their lives. And it's not the bachelor degree education that I went through. It's career education, something that's faster and has so much meaning to them because it's going to allow them to put food on the table for their family. And yeah, the irony struck me and it struck my family. Like you're in education. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Um, but, uh, but that's where I ended up. Yeah. And, and, and you did, and you did pretty well there. Like I said, you moved up to VP and I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about how you think you were able to move up so quickly because uh, you spent, uh, I think the majority of your time, eight or nine years there at a very high level. So how do you think, that you managed to do that? Um, you know, I think that all those years of struggling through college and wanting to work really motivated me to work. And I, you know, I, here I am in my young 20s. It's an upstart company. Um, it, 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 they're looking for people that are wanting to grow and expand. And, and I'm always raising my hand going, yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. Don't pay me more. I don't care. I'll do it anyway. Um, and I'll show you how much I'm worth. I'll, I'll make you pay me more eventually by taking on this extra work. And so there were a number of opportunities at that time. We had uh, seven schools across the U.S. and there were two in Virginia that were brand new and we were trying to set up. And it would, it, they would look for someone, you know, who can go to Virginia and enroll students? Who, who can go Sunday? What's today, Friday? Who can leave Sunday to go to Virginia and enroll these students? I can. You know, who can stay in Virginia for 50 days in an, and run this campus? I will. Um, who can go to Florida for two weeks in, in uh, Fort Myers, Florida and stay for, for a couple of weeks and, and work with the school, do this, I'll do it. And, and there were other people that were asked that said no, and I kept saying yes. And so then those other people stopped being asked and I kept getting asked because I said yes the other couple of times. It's like, you know what it's like when you, you have a friend that you always ask out to go get a drink and they say no every single time and eventually you just stop asking because you know they're going to say no. Um, and so you ask the friend that you know is going to say yes. It's that same kind of thing. So all those people who uh, might have had a leg up in the organization 
said no for numbers of reasons. And it wasn't like the, it wasn't that the organization wouldn't work with them. If they had kids and family, they would just go for shorter periods of time. Uh, but I just said, yes. And I think that's a, a big thing for me at that time as I was building confidence and career was I'll do whatever it takes. I will literally scrape gum off the ground with my fingernails. If I have to, I, I am willing to do it all pick up trash, uh, you know, whatever. And I did, I have, um, to, to get to, to get to be the person that you depend on. That's what I, that was my goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I really, um, I think that what you're saying, it, it are some really good tips for people who want to grow in their career. So I think that there are times when people see folks with titles like you have today, which are impressive. Um, but they don't necessarily, uh, think about all of the things that you had to do in order to get there. So it's the always willing to raise your hand, willing to take on projects that maybe sometimes you don't know how exactly you're going to get it done, but you just know that, hey, I am going to get it done and I will figure it out along the way. And also this notion of rolling your sleeves up. I mean, I think that that's really a trait of someone who, who's very entrepreneurial, very CEO-like. It's very much about, yes, I can lead and yes, I can give direction, but if it comes down to it, I will do whatever we need to do to get us over the goal line. And, and they sound, these things sound so simple and so basic, but really it is the consistency of doing these things over and over again that put you in the, the the spotlight or the place where people say, hey, um, you know, Joe has shown up so many times, like he's, it's clearly this, this roles for him. You know, so much, is, it's about positioning too. Cause you know, the other side of that is there are so many leaders that, that uh, today it's hard to respect because they don't have the um, history uh, or at least don't seem like they're relatable and down to earth. And so when you do achieve a, a role, a high level role, it's important to remember the people that are doing that work now that want to get the job that you have. So you have an appreciation for it, uh, but you know, you want to position yourself. Um, there's going to be opportunity. And so are you considered someone's going to quit? Somebody always leaves a company, right? And so does, does the hiring manager go, what about Joe? You know, he's, he might be too young, but, you know, at this time in his career, but he's here and he does these things. What about him? Um, if you're not in the conversation, you don't get anything. So put yourself in the conversation. Yeah, that's a great tip. And the way you do that is by, is by actually executing. Um, yep. But let's switch to a, a, you know, a little bit what, what you're uh, working on over at Claremont today. So do you want to share a couple things uh, about the school? I mean, I know I, we gave you an intro earlier, but do you want to share a little bit about what you're working on over there? I would love to. Uh, Cl Claremont Lincoln University is a very innovative, fully online nonprofit graduate university. Um, so we have five graduate programs um, in human resources, healthcare, uh, sustainability, social impact, and organizational leadership. And our goal is to equip 21st century leaders with the skills to, to navigate um, in today's really demanding leadership roles. We, we have what, what I like to call the perfect storm of unrest. We have social unrest, we have financial unrest, and we have uh, uh, our health uh, that is disrupted. We need leaders. We need ethical um, leaders that know how to treat people the way that they want to be treated. And that's what Claremont Lincoln University does. Our curriculum uh, has embedded within it four key skills called the Claremont Core in mindfulness, dialogue, collaboration, and change, like you mentioned in the introduction. And the idea here is that with mindfulness, you have to know yourself. You have to know how to dialogue with people who, have who you have differences with. And we're seeing that some people don't know how to do that today. Um, uh, you then have to know how to collaborate with that person that you have differences with so that you can make some type of sustainable change. So the students that we're putting out are leaders already. Um, when they're done with their project, their capstone project, where they actually go and make sustainable change, they're better equipped to deal with the 21st century, right? The, there's been a, a lot of talk about liberal arts education and, and the lack of value in liberal arts education. What does that look like? We believe that our education is a liberal arts education of the future. If you can't have effective human interaction, like we're having today, in particular in a situation where we might disagree, you're not going to be able to lead in the 21st century. 
and th so our, our school is prepping tomorrow's leaders and uh, the work that they're doing is simply incredible and I would encourage everybody to check it out uh, in our websites claremontlincoln.edu okay awesome yeah so go check that out and then um do you and then you're also augmenting it with your awesome podcast so you want to share a little bit about the ed up sure the ed up experience is america's uh, premier higher education podcast it's growing uh rapidly and exponentially we um uh, talk with ed tech entrepreneurs university presidents uh, university leaders and uh you know higher education <laughs> Higher education hadn't, hasn't had anything like it before. A podcasting isn't really that hot in higher education. So my co-host and I, Elizabeth Liba, and our producer, Elvin Freitas, we uh, bring a little bit of fun to an industry that needs some fun. When you want, if you want to talk about higher education, uh, Savvy, what do you want to talk about? Online education, learning and teaching and blah, blah, blah. So we have a little bit of fun with it. And uh, our, the presidents that we talk to love coming on and it's growing. Uh, very, very well, and very excited about it. Awesome. So, uh, th and thanks for sharing about the the podcast. Um, so, to close today, and and thanks so much for being on the show. To close today, what I'd like is if you could share three tips with the audience as to why um, the struggles that they face are their biggest strengths. Well, I think the first one is. Um, it's hard to see opportunity in struggle when you're struggling. And I am an example of that. And I, and I still, to this day, think about that scholarship and, and, and how I had so little self-confidence and was struggling so much that I couldn't see it as an opportunity. So the first tip I have for your struggles is to see the opportunity in struggle, right? To push yourself outside of your comfort zone, which we know is so hard. It's hard to change. Um, but it's necessary, it's unavoidable, it's constant. And if you don't try to seize the opportunity within the, the smoke and mirrors that struggle creates, you really do look back on life later and go, what if I had done this? Or what if I had done that? And that's a hard place to be sometimes. The second one I would say is understand your value. You hear people talk about that a lot in leadership coaching, but truly you have to understand your personal value uh, to a situation. When you're struggling, it's hard to see your value. Um, and, and so you have to sit down and you have to intentionally think about what your value is. It's probably stronger than you think it is when you're not struggling. And certainly a lot stronger than you think it is when you're struggling. So understand your value, sit down, write down what your skills are, and remind yourself, I can do these things. And, and so I'm struggling now. But that's the third thing. It goes away. Struggling always goes away, um, it, one way or the other. And, and, and I don't want to devalue people that struggle and go on to much more serious consequences. But, but if you can, can, can hone your mind, that struggle will go away. Wait a week, wait two weeks. And then it just seems like a little bit less of a struggle. Um, depending on the severity of that struggle, you know, that time creates distance and, and all those things are positive. But in, in a situation where you're struggling, Focus on the future. Think about things a month from now. Month isn't that long, uh, but it can be a real distance from the struggle if you focus on it. And that's, those are my tips. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Your, your tips are really spot on. It's more about um, you know, focusing on what is on the other side of the struggle and less about what you're actually going through. Because if you keep going through it, like you will get to the other side. So I really do like what you had to share and, and thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, it's been my pleasure and an honor and keep it up and doing great work. Thank you, thank you. So thanks so much everyone for joining the show this week. Please remember to subscribe on pod, to my podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts and follow me at Savvy Barrows on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube and message me and let me know what you think about the show. Until next week, friends, take care.